Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm your host, Megan. I'm Hannah. And today I've got a story that does not get wrapped up with a nice bow like we talked about. Are you shitting me right now? <laughs> no. You had one job. Okay, listen, after I No, I don't want to listen. Finished the story, I was like, oh shoot. That's very open-ended and gives us no answers. <laughs> you know what I have to say to you right now? What? How rude. <laughs> <laughs> oh my Lanta. <laughs> uh okay. So we're just gonna dive into this pool and see what you think. Fine, but just know I'm sick of you right now. Deal. Okay. Ray Rivera was a 32-year-old writer, and his family was from Puerto Rico. He was 6'5", 260 pounds, and was a water polo player. It looked like he was in really great shape. People say that his big smile just lit up the room, and he was really family-oriented. When he was growing up, his dad was actually in the military, so they were constantly moving around. The family had a really tight bond because of this. Ray liked to always make people laugh, and his dream was to become a writer and a director. He was a newlywed and had just married Allison Rivera, and they planned on starting a family together. Ray had been working as an aquatics coach at a local high school in Burbank, California. George, the assistant coach, says, quote, I remember the players would sprint to the side of the pool during timeouts just to listen to what Ray had to say. The kids really responded to him because they knew he knew what he was talking about. Ray was also working on screenplays, but that wasn't necessarily bringing in the money that they needed. He had a friend named Porter Stansberry in Baltimore who always wanted Ray to come write for him at his company. He decided to take the job and would be writing financial newsletters. Ray and his wife didn't really know anything about Baltimore or even the company that he was going to work for. Me either. <laughs> they decided <laughs> to just make a deal with each other. They were like, okay, let's go to Baltimore and give it 24 months. But they ended up loving it right away. They found a great house, a church, the community was awesome. Ray and Allison were happy. On May 16th, 2006, Allison had to leave early because she was going on a business trip. Ray got up with his wife to make her breakfast and load her luggage into the vehicle. Around 6 to 6.30 p.m., Allison finished her workday, got to her hotel room, and then she called Ray. He didn't pick up, and she thought it was kind of strange for him. They did have a house guest that was staying over named Claudia, and Allison decided to give her a call to see where her husband was. Claudia told her that she heard Ray take an urgent phone call around 6.30 p.m., and then he rushed out of the house. She walked around the house to see if he had maybe come back yet, and she did confirm. She was like, he is not here. At 5.30 a.m. the next morning, Claudia called Allison and said, Ray still hasn't come home. Allison knew something was wrong right away. She jumped in the car to head home and started calling everybody that they knew. No one had talked to him, and they were all really worried. It was actually so out of character for Ray that his brother, Angel, jumped on a plane from Orlando to Baltimore. Holy cow. That's how out of character this was. When Allison arrived, she saw that Ray's car wasn't there, and there was an open can of pop, a bag of chips, and Ray's Invisaligns were sitting on the counter. She ran up the stairs, and the bedroom light was on, and the office light was on as well. Family and friends all began taking flights to get to Baltimore as quickly as possible, and they all started calling around town. Now, Porter Stansberry, the one that had Ray and Allison move out there, uh, he put up a $1,000 reward to find Ray and says that he was hiring a private detective as well. 
Wow. He also made the following statement. He said, quote, he's a happy guy. He and his wife had just booked a trip to go to New Mexico in a few weeks. This is not a man that wanted to leave. I've got to find my friend. I can't imagine my life without him. He's my best friend. It sounds good, but don't get too choked up. (laughs) During this time, Ray's cell phone was dead. There was no activity on the credit cards and money had not been taken from the bank account. He just vanished. Everyone was searching for days, and Allison's parents had been going around town checking all of the parking lots for Ray's car. The car was discovered in parking spot number 7 on St. Paul Street. There was a parking ticket on the car, and it was issued six days prior, which would be on the day that Ray disappeared. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh, indeed. Police arrived on the scene and searched the vehicle. There was not anything in there that was helpful or really provided any clues. Two days later, on May 24th, three of Ray's co-workers were walking through the parking garage where the car was discovered. They went to the top and they were just looking around and they noticed a hole in the lower roof of the Belvedere Hotel. I've heard this story! Yeah, I'm not surprised. I'm so- I cannot believe it took me until now to realize it. Sorry, I didn't mean to like, interrupt you, but I got really excited. <laughs> I totally... Oh, my God. Okay. Okay, sorry. Here we go. <laughs> it's like when you hear them so often, like, they yeah. just all kind of mesh together. So sometimes it takes, like, a detail like that for me to be like, oh, shit. And I kind of give a lot of background first before I get to it anyway, so... Which I like. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Okay, so they noticed the hole in the roof of the Belvedere Hotel, which was next to the parking ramp. Next to the hole was flip-flops. The hole wasn't big at all. The roof is white, and the hole just looks kind of like a black mark and can only be seen if you're standing on top of the parking garage or on top of the Belvedere Hotel. The co-workers called police, and they had the security door opened. A stench filled the air as soon as the door was opened and blood was on the wall. The door led to an abandoned meeting room that had a metal ceiling, and that's where Ray's body came through. The poor security guard that had, had to go in. That door. I know. I feel like I actually watched something with him in it where he was saying that it, like, really, really fucked him up. Yeah. And it would me too. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't want that. Nope. He had been missing for eight days at this point, so decomposition had really set in. And as we all know, decomposition destroys a lot of the evidence, too. The autopsy did show multiple ribs fractured, punctured lungs, damage to the skull, and seven to nine-inch lacerations. The right leg had two breaks, and the bone was protruding through the flesh. Ugh. Yeah, that's gross. The injuries point to the idea that Ray fell from a pretty high height. Also, the hole in the ceiling was pretty small. It would actually be a really tight fit for his body to go through, and that's kind of why I mentioned his measurements at the beginning of the story. And, like, all the shit he ended up on a roof anyway. Right. So, it does suggest that he fell from a high height and then basically shot through the ceiling like a missile. The hole was not horizontal or rectangular. It was literally only big enough for an upright body to fit through. Like, a really tight fit. The first theory was that Ray came off the top roof and dropped 10 to 11 stories down and then busted through the lower roof. The top roof is about 40 feet of open area. The body didn't drop straight down like you would think. The hole was about 45 feet away. Now, I'm not saying he dropped down 45 feet. He literally would need to fly 45 feet forward, then drop down to where the hole is. And somehow leave his flip-flops sitting on, 
or next to the hole. Yes. Like how? How? Right. Now, if he, even if he did like a running start, that seems impossible. Because, you know, like you were saying, he was wearing the flip flops, which would make running real difficult. Don't yep. know if you've tried that. It kind of sucks. Uh, also, Ray was incredibly afraid of heights. Oh, that's right. So, that doesn't sound like something he'd do. He had no history of mental illness. There wasn't anything traumatic that had, like, recently happened to him. And he had actually booked an office space for that very weekend so that he could go finish up a project. Why would he even bother doing that if his intention that day was just to take his life? During the investigation, Ray's cell phone was discovered on the rooftop near the hole. It was in working order and the screen was not cracked. They also found his glasses and there was not a scratch on them. Now you have to tell me how somebody could jump or fall several stories down, but the glasses and phone just aren't cracked, aren't scratched, nothing. Nope. So the shoes are left behind right next to the hole. Uh-huh. Got the cell phone perfect condition, glasses yes. perfect condition. Correct. Yeah, no. And, I mean, Ray had a lot of injuries. And the flip-flops themselves were broken. The straps came out and there were drag marks on the front of the shoes. That's awful. Yes. I mean, obviously, when you look at the scene, it, to me looks and feels very staged. Right. And then his glasses and phone seem to have been just kind of placed at the scene as an afterthought. Which is exactly the same thing with the shoes. Right, yes. They were all just chilling. Yeah. One thing that should have been at the scene, though, was missing. Ray had a money clip, and this was kind of his signature thing. His wife gave it to him as a wedding gift, and he always had it with him and then clipped his ID and money in it. Allison says that she saw the money clip in his hand before she left for her work trip. So let's talk about the Belvedere Hotel a little bit. Like any large hotel, it has tons of windows. The guests at the hotel were questioned and nobody saw or heard anything on the day of Ray's death. He obviously wasn't staying at the hotel, so it doesn't even make sense that he would be able to get to the roof. You know, you can't just, like, waltz into the lobby of the hotel and then head right up. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> um, and they say that to actually get there, you have to take the stairs and a bunch of the doors are locked and can only be accessed by employees. The cameras were checked and Ray was never seen inside the hotel. The camera on the roof wasn't working on this day. Oh, hmm. of course not. Convenient. Uh, lots of red flags. Stupid ass cameras never work, man. I know. Every time we need them to, the camera wasn't working that day. Ah. <laughs> <sighs> but with all of this information, the police said, I think it's a suicide. It's real nice. Yes. I just wish we could get to the point where... It was never labeled suicide until we are, like, so, so, so super like positive. 100% positive. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, even leave agree. it undetermined or something, I don't care. The family was adamant that Ray did not take his life. He had just gotten married, got a new job, was ready to start a family. He was really excited. Ray's wife, Allison, had more questions and was just trying to piece everything together. She decided to meet with the medical examiner, and when she got there, the medical examiner closed the door. She told Allison, I know what they're trying to do, and we're not closing this case. The way Ray's shins were broken wasn't consistent with a fall, but that's all they could tell her. The medical examiner declared the case undetermined. The case can't be closed when it happens because there isn't a conclusion. Oh, the medical examiner that shut the door when she tried to get there? No, 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 or no. was that? She brought her in and shut the door and, Got like, it. quietly okay. told her. 
Like, this is what's happening. And that's literally all that's they could... That's all she could say. They didn't give them anything else. No. Just that the shins uh-huh. were not consistent with the fall. Yeah. And it makes me believe that mm. they are worried about yeah, something. about... Yeah. Or someone. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Ray's brother, Angel, told the Washington Examiner off the record that staff members of the hotel say they believe Ray would have had to be pushed to land the way that he did. They say there's another set of doors to the roof and it would be more logical that he was pushed from there. Allison continued to investigate and she found a note behind the computer at the house. It was folded up small and the font was really tiny. The note was folded up in a plastic bag and it was taped to the back of the home computer screen and there was a blank check with it. Allison had seen scraps of paper in the trash after his disappearance and she believes that he wrote the note on the morning of his death. Now, I wasn't able to find the entire note online. I'm sure other people could. I don't know. I looked everywhere for this thing. Uh, But there are some lines that were discussed in the Netflix Unsolved episode, so I pulled some things from that. And then this is just like a random mixture of the lines that they used. Uh, The note does start off like this, though. Quote, brothers and sisters, right now around the world, volcanoes are erupting. What an awesome sight. Whom virtue unites, death will not separate. I stand before you a man who understands the purpose and value of our secrets. That's why I cherish them as secrets. That was a well-played game. Congratulations to all who participated. Life is a test to see if you can control your spirit. Take care and enjoy the festivities. Okay, so, like, super strange. I don't know what we're talking about here. Yeah, I feel like there's a huge meaning behind it, though. I think so, too. And then there were names of people that he knew, but his wife said that he left out several significant people that she would expect to see on the list if he was just writing out, like, everyone he cared about or something. Right. And there was a list of movies, directors, books, music, and TV shows. None of it made sense, but, you know, maybe it could be a code. There were famous people included on the list that have died, such as Christopher Reeve and Stanley Kubrick. The note included a request to make them and himself five years younger. The note was sent to the FBI, and all they were able to determine was, that's not a suicide note. Thanks a heap. Holy crap. Right? (laughs) was very helpful yeah a reddit sleuth did notice that ray listed david fincher's the game in his letter this was a 1997 film about a man who gets caught up in an elaborate scheme and then the company makes him think that he's lost everything and he jumps off a roof of a building through a glass ceiling Allison says she doesn't believe that there's any significance to this. She said that Ray actually had notebooks all over the house, and he would just write random ideas and thoughts all over them and then things that he liked. Okay, yeah, but he folded this one up, put it in a bag, and taped it to the back of a damn computer. Correct. Yes, he sure did. I think she's just saying she doesn't think that the movie itself has any significance. Um, Such as, like, he's not trying to recreate that scene or anything. She actually says it's not surprising to her that the note makes no sense. Because he was interested in a lot of different types of movies and was just interested in everything. And it wasn't out of the ordinary for him to just write a whole bunch of things down. Allison says her husband was also interested in the Freemasons. And on the weekend before his disappearance, he was reading a book called The Builders, A Study of Masonry. On the day of his disappearance, he actually went to the bookstore and purchased the book Freemasons for Dummies, and he talked with a member of the Maryland Lodge about joining the Freemasons. If you're not familiar with Freemasonry, 
It's a fraternal men's only organization, and it's one of the world's largest secret societies. It's not a religion, but they do have their own beliefs and rituals. Well, it's not a secret anymore. Right. It's a secret society that everybody knows about. (laughs) So, (laughs) the phrase that Ray used in his note, whom virtue unites, death will not separate, is actually a motto that's used on the Masonic rings and at the Masonry Temple. The Freemasons use cryptic language and symbolism, which is another reason that Ray's note is getting so much attention. On the day of Ray's disappearance, he received a call that made him bolt out of the house. The call was traced and came back from Stansbury Associates, where Ray worked. This couldn't actually be traced further than that because it came from the switchboard. The company put a gag order on their employees within hours of Ray's body being found. Ray's friend, Porter Stansberry, blocked everybody from helping and wouldn't return calls to investigators. When I say they were friends, they were like best Best friends. friends, So you think you would want to jump in on that. Right. Yeah. They went to school together. They were on the same water polo team. They brought dates to prom together. This is somebody that Ray trusted. And now he, like, can't provide a comment to the police about his friend's death? Yeah, that's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Porter also declined to provide a comment for the Netflix Unsolved episode. Now, I did read through my research that Porter has been contacting other podcasts and letting them know that this is all false information. He says he never put a gag order out on his employees and that he did cooperate with the police. That's nice. That's another one to add to the list that's going to happen to us this week. Thanks. Um, I <laughs> can guarantee he's not going to come after ours. <laughs> uh, it's, it was like, I think maybe Crime Junkie. Oh. Possibly. And then I saw a couple others. It was all really big podcasts. Got it. Um, But I just want to throw it out there so now you don't have to message me. Okay? Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Now you don't have to message me. (laughs) I did it for you. (laughs) Before Ray died, he was working as a freelance videographer and was producing videos of conferences. He had also been working on a newsletter called The Rebound Report, and that basically gives stock tips. Before Ray moved to working with Stansbury, they did have some legal troubles. They put out a letter where they talked about a Russian firm that was discovering uranium. The tip didn't work out, and investors complained, and the SEC filed fraud charges against Stansbury, and they were fined $1.5 million. This gave Porter a pretty bad reputation, and that was the reason he hired Ray in the first place. He was supposed to kind of come in and clean up the mess and write financial newsletters. Allison says that Ray was very worried about something two weeks prior to his death, but he didn't want to talk about it. On the Monday before he went missing, the house alarm went off at 1 a.m. Allison went down the stairs and she saw Ray flying through the house with a bat. And she said she could see the fear all over his face. He was a big guy. He was fit. He was never scared. So this was really surprising for her to see. The police came out and said it was probably a squirrel. The following Tuesday at 1 a.m. a big-ass squirrel. Yeah, it is a big-ass squirrel. (laughs) So the following Tuesday at 1 a.m., the alarm went off. The window had been tampered with. Is that a squirrel, too? A big-ass squirrel? (laughs) Yeah. And that evening is when Ray went missing. Allison says these two incidents are the first time their alarm had ever gone off. She thinks Ray accidentally stumbled across information that he wasn't supposed to see. Oh, while working? Yeah. Oh. Uh Uh-huh. 
and the motive could also be money-related. Ray puts out the publication with stock tips, and they're wondering what if somebody lost, like, a shit ton of money and then wanted to go oh, after him. pissed at him for it? Yeah. After the wedding and move, it's possible that Ray was low on money. What if he found something out about his employer and then decided he wanted to sell that story? That could prompt somebody at the company to maybe order a hit. Yeah. We talked earlier about that mysterious call that Ray received from Stansberry and Associates on the day of the disappearance. Well, it turns out there was a second mysterious call. Radio Times reported that during an interview on the You Can't Make This Up podcast, Unsolved Mysteries co-creator Terry Dunmauer says there is another call. While police were investigating Ray's computer, someone called to ask about it. Terry says, quote, When Allison Rivera went to the police station to pick up Ray's computer, the detective mentioned someone had called a couple times and asked to pick up the computers and was very interested in the status of the computers. Uh-oh. Allison was very troubled. I think there's literally no way Stansberry and Associates isn't involved somehow, right. somewhere in this. No, I'm, a, I'm in agreement. I mean, the call was traced back to their switchboard, and that's the call that prompted Ray to leave the house. Right. He left all of the lights on. He didn't clean up. Something made him leave fast. I think there is a hidden code in that note for two reasons. I also agree with that. <laughs> Uh, all of the other things Ray wrote about in his notebooks were just laying around the house in the open. He wasn't hiding anything but that note. It was written small, folded small, and taped behind a computer. Perhaps it's pointing to a specific code that Freemasons use? I think there's a significance to that blank check that was left with the note as well. Yeah. Now, I looked it up, and there is an initiation fee that you pay the lodge so that you can be in good standing with the Freemasons when you start. We know that Ray called the lodge that day. Maybe the check was for that. Or was it another symbol? I don't know how Ray's body went through the roof like it did, but I mean... <laughs> It makes me think that he was higher up than people believe. And I have no idea on this. This is just my thoughts. Uh, because if he ran and jumped off the roof of the Belvedere, he couldn't have dropped through in such an upright position. Right. And I'm not an expert on that, but I just don't see how it's possible. I know it sounds crazy, and I can't give a really good explanation on how this would have gone down. But my thoughts after all of it is kind of what if he was dropped from a helicopter? You know, that actually crossed my mind. Okay, because I feel crazy. I feel like someone would have to see something, a body falling from a helicopter. I don't know, because it would of, go fast. It would. I guess I don't know. And then, like, would they run back over there later and drop off his stuff to, like, make it look like he jumped or something? That's sort of my thoughts. Because, like, if the helicopter was high enough, maybe people wouldn't hear it. Uh, and then that would explain why nobody saw him ever well, inside the hotel. No matter how high those bitches are, I always hear them. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel like somebody would be like... I guess when I say like, nobody heard can... it... If you're in a hotel room and you hear yeah, a helicopter not... in the distance, are you going to pay attention? Right. No. No, Um, I, I could see how that could be a theory, yeah. And then if he was pushed, how would he not land on his back or stomach when he hit the roof? Right, and it's like, no matter... Listen, this is coming from an expert in falling, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every time I've ever fallen, I have never had my body straight, not once. Never. And I'm like... I just don't see how it's possible. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering if something happened to him in another location, then he was dropped right. off there. And that's why the money clip has never been located to this day. They searched the hotel, the car, the house. It's gone. Right. And that is all I have for you. <sighs> that was a lot to unpack. I know. 
I'm just pissed that you told me another one without a good ending, man. I need I need an ending. I need it to be wrapped up. Okay. Okay, can we try it? You know what? Never I can mind. Try. I can No, never mind, because <laughs> the last time you said you were going to try this, what you gave me, so. These are just coming to me. Well, I, I don't mean, know why. I'm guess I'm glad because they need to be out there. Yes. But. I want to know what's going on. It is really, the whole thing is really weird. It's freaking me out. And it's like it gets weirder and weirder as it goes, like with the note and everything. Yeah. It just gets weirder as it goes. And maybe some of our listeners have better theories than I do. Uh, You can send them over to us. I would love to hear what you think. Do it. Yeah, if you want to just, like, toss that out on Facebook or something, feel free. Let's get a discussion going. Oh. Oh, we're going to get a discussion going. Yeah, I'm going to get on the social medias and... There you not go. just not just one social media, but social media. I'm mean, gonna get on all the social medias. Yep. <laughs> there <And>. you have <laughs> it. <laughs> so <laughs> you can go ahead and send us any stories that you want to hear from us, and follow us on any of your podcast apps. Like us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Give us a five star review if you love us. Tell your friends, tell your cats, um, bye! Bye.